So Virgil's Aeneid is the topic today. Uh, second epic we've looked at. Very different than the first, but also unrecognizable, unimaginable without the first. When I say the first, there were two that constituted the primary epics from Homer at any rate, the Iliad and the Odyssey. Uh, I, I don't know if I mentioned or not, I think I might, but uh, I didn't make much of it. There's also epics written by a poet by the name of Hesiod, H-E-S-I-O-D. He tends to write more at the level of um, almost metaphysics. He talks about origins. One's called cosmogony or um, uh, the topic is cosmogony, uh, the battle of the gods, where the gods came from, etc. That the other is called works and days. Um, I'm going to compare and contrast, but we'll see. Mostly, there's a comparison, as in there is a a model that or a template that has been established that the Roman writer Virgil will follow. And in doing that, he's really following what I've already tried to say is the model of, to be found throughout human history, which is that just simply of imitation. If something is great, then you try and imitate it. That's what you do. And uh, Aristotle says that people do it naturally. It's one of the features of human nature is that we love to imitate. A, it's not just that we do it, we love to do it. There's a, a pleasure that comes with the imitation. <clears throat> uh, we take delight when somebody mimics somebody else, their accent, their mannerisms, whatever. You know, it's funny. If you, some people are very good at it. I don't think that's what Aristotle means by that. I think he means in all things. We human beings take delight in seeing the nature of things and repeating it. And learning to some degree is, is loving what you, the nature of what you see and trying to get to the bottom of it and to be able to uh, master it, to understand it. Uh, I had somebody, in one of you in my class, I won't name, it's not important. Um, we were talking about naming and it struck me that this is what is so interesting about this age and the emphasis of the course even is that I've been suggesting that the stories really matter uh, and the languages really matter and, and even down to the names really matter. Names matter here in uh, ancient literature and even more so in biblical literature because the name betrays the essence. There's an, a relation between the essence of things and the names that we give to them. When Adam names the animals in Genesis 2.15, I take it as he is talking about the essential nature of the things that he's describing. <clears throat> you may think that that's un, an unremarkable thing to say, but modern views of language post 20th century suggests that there's no relation between our words and the things that we describe. It's just a relationship of power. <coughs> we're, when, when we name something, we're, we're gaining power over it, but there's, no, there's nothing of the thing that we're naming that we're, in a sense, loving in the process of naming it. When you name your child, you love the child, and you're giving it a very distinctive name that it's going to be uh, a part of the relationship of it, an individual person there. That person has a name. It's not just baby. It's whatever the baby's name is. You're, you're identifying a particular baby and, you, and thereby relating it to it. And you may be some, that name may have significance to you for a, a, a wide variety of reasons. In scripture, it, it reveals a great deal about the person actually. From Jesus on downwards, it's saying something about not only the identity of the person, but what they're going to accomplish, the meaning of that person for broader purposes and so forth. So when Odysseus gives away his name to Polyphemus, um, he's done something unwise, but also he is, he's betrayed himself. <clears throat> An essence of himself has been given away 
where somebody can rob him of his identity, and he ends up being thrown onto the island of Calypso, where he's hidden away. And he's still a man, but he's a man that's been shorn of his identity. He doesn't have a family. He doesn't have a country. He doesn't have a role in life. He's offered immortality, every carnal pleasure a man could be after, but he do, he's robbed of all the things that will make a man a man for the Greeks, right? And something's being said by Homer about what it means to be a human being. It means not only being interested in your selfish interests, but being interested in seeing your identity tied up in the well-being of your family and the well-being of your nation and the well-being of what's just. Those, those are, and doing the right things, those are part of your identity. So don't just be like an animal that lives forever. Be more than that. And Odysseus is a hero for that reason. A question or comment? Yeah, I was just wondering, uh, it came out last time you brought up um, names in Odysseus and when it gives it away. Yeah. So that moment of it seems to be weakness for Odysseus, is that to humanize him so that the, the audience can relate with him more? Because it seems like Odysseus is supposed to be this person that we can't really be like, but we're supposed to look up to and strive for, right? So how does that well, it certainly does humanize him, I guess, but it seems more like an object lesson in uh, what a terrible thing it is not to prize your own, own identity, to be careless with it. It's an example of what not to do. The example is sort of silly in the sense of that scenario is not going to pop up again, but what, what's really at stake in that episode, that, I think that's what it is, like thinking about it philosophically he uh, exposes his own, all the things that he loves have been put at risk by one rash act of revealing himself to this character who he doesn't think can harm him. And, uh, and so there's something that's being said, again, the whole secrecy thing that seems sort of odd, come back in incognito to your own, but the purpose of it is, it's not yet time, and you have to be ready to hold on to what's essential about you and guard that very carefully, because these things are easy to lose, and people will try and take them away from you. The suitors are going to rob you of house and home. You're going to have to be very careful to guard what is most important about you. And, not, and, the, and again, for us, particularly in our world, there's very much of a me-first attitude. Right? And so we have a man, Odysseus, with a nymph, Calypso, and he's crying on the beach. Yeah, right. Sure he is. What? You know, he has the nymph. He has, you know, she is going to remain beautiful. She's never going to get old. He's going to remain as he is eternally. He's not going to get old. He can eat as much as he wants. He's eating the food of the gods, drinking the, the uh, drink of the gods, and having every sexual pleasure he can imagine with this eternal goddess, whatever. And he's sad. Sure he is. That's people, I've heard people say, oh, come on, I don't believe this, this is ridiculous. I, I, I think that this is an unfair judgment, and it is judging, it, it, it reveals something about the character who's making the judgment. <clears throat> the, our standards judge him, that his, what he is bewailing is not real. It's not very realistic, but it is if you know what sort of man it is you're dealing with there. And that was my point. He's a better man than us, but we want to be that better man. And you can be. You follow this example. You, d you, ignore, you don't indulge yourself in these ways. You restrain yourself. You, you prize these things more. What does he want to do most? He wants to get home. He wants to go back to being the king because the people need him. There's anarchy in his midst, in, in his absence. There's anarchy, and he needs to get back for the sake of them and also his own honor. Remember, this is a, a legendary figure who he hears the stories of his own greatness and he's not even there yet. And he's like, I have to do everything I can so that I am that man. And remember, he's fated to be there as well. So there's an interesting, uh, it's very interesting to take that figure um, of Odysseus and the virtues that he has and then compare them to the Aeneid because Aeneas is very much like Odysseus in that sense. He will suffer greatly. 
and he will also do it for the glory of Rome. In fact, that's really the story of the Aeneid. But I want to pull back a little bit and do a contrast, first of all, because there is a difference between the Greeks and the Romans in the way they look at things. Uh, the Greeks looked backwards to a better time in the past. If you look at Hesiod, he talks about a golden age, the golden age before everything went wrong. There was a golden age, and then a war broke out amongst the gods, started the, the silver age. But the golden age when Kronos ruled, and then his son, Jupiter, rebelled against him. There's a prior rebellions there as well, but there's a, there's, a, there's a rebellion within the gods that brings about injustice. It was unjust. Things were good, but the gods, for some reason, were selfish. They wanted it different than it was, and that brought about a degeneration. So things were originally the best that they could ever be, and then because of the gods' selfishness, they started things on a downward path. And the, the Greek view is that it's a cycle even. So it begins with a golden age, it goes to a silver age, it then goes to a bronze age, and then finally the iron age, four ages. The silver age is that of the gods, where, where there are no human figures. The bronze age is the one that we're reading about. This is the heroic age. It's the age of Aeneas and Odysseus and Achilles. These are when we have demigods. One parent's a god, the other parent's a human, doing s things that mortal men don't do, like they go down to the underworld and come back up. They found nations. They do extraordinary uh, acts of athletics or wisdom or whatever. They're, they're superhuman. That's the Bronze Age. We don't live in that age. We live in the Iron Age when things are really bad, when men are bad. They aren't capable of this greatness, but we can look backwards and think we ought to be like that. There are models for us. We should be striving in that direction. And that, but that's how the Greeks look at it. They look backwards to a time when things were better. In that sense, it's very much a biblical view. Because there in the Bible, I'll talk about this more when we look at uh, Ovid, uh, his work, the talking about the origin of things, the metamorphoses, just the first few chapters. But it's a, it's a better time, like the Garden of Eden. And then it breaks, it, a fall happens. <clears throat> For Hesiod, the Golden Age is, is lost in the past and it can't be recovered. And, and Homer regularly uh, appeals to this idea that things were once better. The people of the past were better than we were. Virgil, on the other hand, is writing in a very different age. He is writing, first of all, he's writing in Latin, not Greek, he's writing in Latin. And he's writing, if Homer is writing his epic, most people say about 800 BC, uh, Homer or Virgil is writing around that time where Jesus entered human history. It's in that period. It's under the reign of Augustus Caesar, Caesar Augustus. And what has been declared under Caesar Augustus is a Pax Romana, the peace of Rome. There is a worldwide global empire at this point. We're, we've moved, and it's, a, it's a, a pivotal point in Roman history as well, because we've just gone from the Roman Republic to the Roman Empire, about, about which much has made in th movies like Star Wars. You know, you move from the Republic to the Empire and so forth. There are good things with the Empire. There are very bad things with the Empire. In general, they're very bad. The Empire is not a good thing. But that's, and, and Virgil is going to be a critic of the Empire, by the way. But for Augustus Caesar, this is a golden age of sorts. And that is, he's even talking about it. Why? Because there's now peace. The things that mark human history, war is behind us. 
Augustus has put all the enemies of Rome under his feet. Augustus means the great, by the way. Caesar the great. <clears throat> and he's the Roman emperor, the first Roman emperor. There was one that before him that sought to be emperor. His name was Julius. And he got knifed by uh, a group of people who didn't want the republic to die. They wanted the empire not to happen. They didn't want a tyrant. They knew what it meant for their own people. So they stabbed him. Marcus Antonius, Mark Antony, Brutus, and so forth. There's a whole list of them. You can read about it in Shakespeare's Julius Caesar, among other places. But they were defending liberty is how they saw it. Whereas in an empire, there will be no more liberty. But there was peace. And the peace of Rome offered the prospect of a golden age in the future. So this is different. The Greeks look to a golden age in the past that can't be recovered and are always appealing to the goodness before them that they want to hold on to somehow. The Romans, to some degree, are hopeful about the future. And he puts the people of Rome and the Roman Empire at the center of human history as a result. Now he does this simultaneous, as I say, with the advent of God in the world in the person of Jesus Christ. That's happening at the same time, where it says that Caesar is Lord, Caesar is the greatest, God at the, on the outskirts, in the backwater of the Roman Empire in Israel, in a little place called Bethlehem, <coughs> or even in a town in Nazareth, even in the Jews are saying, is anything good ever come out of Nazareth? Because the answer is no, nothing. Even within Israel, nothing ever good has ever come from Nazareth. And it's Jesus of Nazareth, all right, but like it's a nobody amongst nobodies. That literally, so the, the, the contrast could not be greater. Right at that time, Virgil is saying, this is the glory of Rome, and there is no glory quite like it. That's his epic, he's going to talk about that. So it's very much talking about the present and the future in a way that we don't see with this. It's a very, it's a patriotic epic. We don't get that with Homer. It was about a man, but it was not about an empire or a nation even. So this is a national sort of epic <clears throat> dedicated to Virgil's patron, Augustus Caesar. And we see a lot of Roman history in it ancient Roman history. <clears throat> we also see a lot of the foundational elements of Roman history in it, insofar as it talks about other empires there. It begins with the Battle of Troy, interestingly, but told from the other side, on the side of the Trojans, because the Trojans are the ancestors of the Romans. So you wonder what, who those Trojan people were. Well, we heard about the Greeks. How about the guys that got invaded by the Trojan horse? What happened to them? Where did they go? Was the, they just get wiped out? And the answer is no. One of them, a man by the name of Aeneas, fled the city and, and left and went to ground what is thereafter known as Rome. But it's going to take him a time to go there. He ends up going on a voyage himself. And in fact, what we will see in the Aeneid is a sort of a mirror of Homer's two epics. In the first six books of the Aeneid, we have stories of wanderings, like an odyssey. There's an odyssey that Aeneas is going to undergo to get where he needs to go. And he's going to have to suffer to get where he needs to go. Now, he's not going home. Odysseus, Odysseus wants to get home. Aeneas wants to establish a new Troy, an eternal city. And he will have to suffer. Now, the, that's the first six books. This is a 12-book ep epic. The second six books are all war. It's when he gets there to Italy, to Latium, Wherever you want, whatever you want to call it, it's being, it gets various names here. Um, there are people there, and they do not want him to be there. 
And so he will have to fight to establish a foothold in Italy from the local tribes. So it's a little like the Odyssey and the Iliad put together, but reversed. Rather than a battle, then the Odyssey, it's an Odyssey, then the battle. And so what Virgil's very subtly doing is taking his one epic and comparing it to Homer's two epics, saying my epic, which is 12 books, is greater than Homer's, which is 24 books times two. Very subtle. And the first line of it also is a little bit of a giveaway. Oh, I meant to put this on the blackboard, whiteboard. In two seconds. takes time, so I'll just wait for it and come down. But the very first lines, I sing of arms and of a man. His fate had made him fugitive. He was the first to journey from the coasts of Troy as far as Italy and the Lavinian shores. First line, I sing of arms and of a man. Reference to the two epics of Homer. Of arms is the Iliad, and of a man is the Odyssey. It's after Odysseus, right? In the very first line, he announces the foregoing epics, but he's going to talk about a man who combines both of those. He is the Achilles. He is the Odysseus. He is one man, however. And this becomes a mark of the epic. Uh, hereafter, it was not up to this point. Now it is. Epics that will come after this, and we're going to look at others, will also seek to compare and contrast themselves with their, their foregoing uh, poetic forebears and, and suggest why their epic is superior. Now, excellence is what people are seeking to attain in life in general. It was the essence of uh, Odysseus' life. He wanted arete. He wanted his excellence to be known. His excellence was not confined with simple bodily immortality and with all his pleasures being satisfied. He wanted more than that. He was, there was more to his humanity than that. He had a family. He had a nation. He had a culture. He had parents. He was attached to them. They were a part of his identity. His name was attached to that, and he didn't want to be just himself. You hear that, you know, people say, you be you. I hate that saying. But you be you, you know, whatever that means. Well, how else can you not be you? <laughs> it's just sort of like it is what it is. This is nonsensical saying. Or if you say these things and you're now embarrassed and think, oops, I say that, never mind. Oops. My apologies. Aeneas being Aeneas means being denying Aeneas what Aeneas wants. That is his piety. 
This whole work is about piety. In Christian circles, piety means spiritual fervor, desire for God, living in a way that is pleasing to God. That's piety. It also is that for Virgil, by the way. Doing the God's will, living for God, doing what God wants. And it also has features, uh, does Virgil's and does Christian piety, that we've lost in our so sense of piety as personal faith, private devotions, private faith, private matters. It contains my relationship with my family, <coughs> my devotion to my country, my devotion to the good of the human race. Right in, in the, when Jesus is asked what the greatest commandment was, he says to love the Lord with your heart, soul, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. Note the two aspects. It's not just one. It's not just loving your God. It's loving your neighbor as yourself. So that is a part of your piety. The nearest neighbor that you have is your family. Jesus loved his parents. He spent 30 years with his parents, by the way, before we know anything about him. It's an extraordinary thing. Scripture speaks nothing about it. We don't know anything about the first 30, 30 years of his life, aside from the fact that he was born. Fair bit about that. First two years, we know a little bit. And we know him at year 12 on his bar mitzvah, when he reads from the scroll. And then he disappears for 18 years, as far as the narrative goes. We don't know. But we do know that he lived with his family. His family mattered to him. He was a good boy. He was a dutiful son. He learned his father's trade. He was a carpenter, right? These were important to him. We don't know anything about them. That's because, not because they weren't important to him, but because they weren't uh, related to his essential task, which is to come and bear the sins of humanity and to preach the gospel. That's what the focus of the gospels is. It's on that. But that doesn't mean that those first 30 years were unimportant to him. They were a part of his piety. Remember, Jesus' perf perfection was not just as God, but as a human being. He treated everyone according to their due. He treated his parents with respect. Right? He treated his neighbors, his, his family with love, even his enemies. That's how far that went. For, the, for Aeneas, it will mean something a little bit more... Stoic. Because Virgil is a Stoic. The Stoics were those who believed in natural justice and self-denial. And in the case of Virgil, believed that the soul was of ultimate value, the human soul. And the soul was at risk because of the body. So there's a dualism that goes on in Virgil's thought. It's there very commonly in the ancient world. The body's a prison house for the soul. It's a very spiritual view, though, it, and it leans very much towards Eastern philosophies to prize your soul and to ignore your passions, to deny your body and so forth. It's not Christian. Uh, Jesus is not a spiritual being. He is a, a human being. He has a spirit, of course. He has a soul and a body, but he has a body. He's born of the virgin. He is bodily crucified. He's raised bodily. His bodily nature is a part of his humanity. For Virgil, the bodily nature of humanity is to some degree uh, in conflict with his spirit. That's not a Christian view, but it is in Virgil. We see it in Virgil. His hero, Aeneas, is to some degree going to deny his body, his own desires. Now, it sounds a bit like Odysseus there, right? But I talked about 
what motivated Odysseus. And I think likewise for Virgil, there's more than just the Stoic ideal being pr uh, privileged here. He wants to do it for the sake of his son. Because his son is going to be f so famous that he will one day be the ancestor of his patron, whose name is Augustus Caesar. Aeneas' son is the great, 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 great forebear of uh, Caesar Augustus. He's not just any old kid. It's not just Aeneas' son. This is the ancestor of the current Augustus the Great, or Augustus Caesar. Caesar the Great. And so there's a piety there, which invo involves self-denial. Now, where it comes in, and I think where we get of Virgil's, Virgil being the writer, Virgil's own biases creeping in, is that he doubts that Aeneas will, and the Roman people will ever achieve what Augustus claims he is achieving, namely a return to the golden age. He doesn't think it's possible. And the reason why is because of who the Roman people are and who their celestial patroness is, and that's Venus. Venus is, Athena looked after Odysseus, right? Who looks after Remember the three goddesses I talked about? This is the dispute. And there's Juno, and there's Venus, and there's Athena, three of them quarreling. We got the three goddesses still. Athena with the Greeks, Juno with the Carthaginians. It's going to be a historic enemy of Rome, and Venus with the Romans. What do we know about Venus or Aphrodite? Goddess of love. Goddess of the passions. What do we know just from our study in Plato, what the ancient world thinks about the passions? If you're driven by your passions, this is not good. <laughs> this is not good. The Romans are driven by their passions. Fundamentally, they can't rid themselves of it. It's just part of their national identity almost. By the way, I'm not making Italian racist comments here. <laughs> it's, it's, it's in Virgil, and Virgil seems to be making this judgment. And we'll, we will see that this character of Aeneas is marked by piety, but he's also marked by, and I had it on the board, but I've got rid of it, uh, or maybe I didn't, furore, rage. He gives way to rage in the, in the second half of the Aeneid. We will see that at various points, he loses self-control and kills in ways that are disgraceful, including at the very end of the Aeneid. And his enemy seems more admirable than he does, even. Virgil's making a comment here about the Roman people. The Roman people, remember, it is the Pax Romana, it's the peace of Rome, but how is the peace of Rome achieved? Military crush your enemies. Is that real peace? Like when I beat you down so that you can't get up and we say, okay, we're, the fight's over, right? Yeah, the fight's over. But are we all in agreement that everything is settled? Well, only because I can't get up and continue on with the fight. And that ignores the problem of, well, how about within Rome itself? Are the problems of Roman, the, the Roman passions going to be settled just because there are no more external enemies? No, they'll be internal. So there's a seed of doubt, and I will, I will deal with that when we come to that. But I think we're going to need to read the poem. It's a sophisticated poem. You have to read it on two levels. It is the celebration of Augustus, without a doubt. It is looking forward, and it is suggesting that um, Aeneas, the forebear of Augustus, is a role model for us. He will master his passions. He will show piety. He will devote himself 
to a good that is not his own, but rather the glory of Rome. So put others first. Above all, he's going to do his duty. If you think of Rome, you think of duty. Right? I'm here to do my duty. Very admirable quality. The uh, late Elizabeth II was admired because of this devotion to duty. She made a promise, and she's going to keep it. She made a vow publicly. Here's how I'm going to act. How many people can do that? Very difficult to do. When it's not just you, but your family and all that sort of stuff, you want to give up, you get the press, you get the critics, it just doesn't stop. How can you keep on doing what you said you would do? Uh, he also has a piety to his ancestors. Now, this will sound very familiar to some, those of you from uh, Asian countries. He feels a filial piety to his ancestors. This is not insignificant, it's very important. He feels a duty to the past as well as the future. There is a chain of human nature in which he is only one link. He's not going to emphasize himself. He's not going to talk about his, his, own, his first name. We all go by our first names. Uh, in Asian countries to this day, they introduce themselves by their family name, right? That's the, their identity. They're identifying themselves with the, the family, the group. Very important. We'll see it in, in the Aeneid when Troy is burnt to the ground and he flees the flames and he carries with him his household gods and his household gods are little figurines of his ancestors. Very important that he takes them with him because there's ancestor worship going on here. Whatever you make of that. He's revering their memories, what they did, all the things that they sacrificed so that he could be where he is. I'm going to show homage to that. So he not only reveres the gods, he not only uh, thinks about the future, his son ahead of himself, he also thinks of his ancestors. In fact, he puts everyone ahead of himself. Thoroughly admirable as a certain model of piety. However, as a character, he's not particularly likable. I mean, he's not as colorful. Piety doesn't translate onto the screen very well. But I said there are two levels. You read it as, a, as an homage to Augustus Caesar. I'm talking about your, your great forebear who is starting the whole Roman Empire, and it's just praise. For that. That's one level. The other level is the exact opposite. He supports the idea of a golden age in the past, but he says we're not going back there because of the problem of human nature and a particular problem for the Romans being the offspring of Venus, the goddess of love, Aphrodite. We met her as, as the Greek goddess. We can't undo the things that the gods themselves started in motion. So when Saturn was overthrown by Jupiter, um, it brought about destruction with it, and that can't be undone. Augustus cannot undo that. And it will break out in various ways, the, the consequences of this, but one of them is simply violence and rage and anger and the passions, like, a, like a, a dam breaking. It just breaks out. You can't control it. You should control it. You try to control it. Aeneas is the model of restraint, but even he can't control himself. And if he can't control himself, as great as he is, who will? Like if the great man fails, how will we lesser mortals succeed? And the only way he does succeed is through war. And Virgil is not a, uh, a warrior, he's a pacifist. Add to the complexity here. He thinks that war is a, is a terrible thing. And it is a, a terrible thing for anyone who's conservative because war unleashes consequences that, that don't just destroy your opponent, they destroy you. 
To go to war is a terrible thing. It requires you to give more money to your government. It requires your sons to go overseas to a war. And you're going to lose them. You're going to lose money. You're going to lose family. And it'll all be put to the service of the state and your family's going to get neglected and we've already seen the consequences in the Odyssey. It's destructive to a nation. You don't want to go to war. That's the last thing you want to do is go to war. But that's how the Romans get their peace is through war. It's not a good means. Virgil sees it in different terms. Let's do it through the arts of peace rather than the arts of war. Diplomacy, compromise. Stoics as a philosophical uh, sect tended to be involved in government and they were there to try and prevent war from happening. Because war means anarchy and anarchy means justice is denied all over the place. There's no liberties anymore. Just think of what we've gone through the COVID stuff. It's like a war on the virus ended up being a war on the populace. Whether that was explicit in the intent or not, that was the consequence. Everyone's like under lockdown. It's like martial law. Right? So that's what happens when you declare a war. Bad things happen all over the place. <clears throat> um, and Virgil has another reason as a Stoic why he is suspicious of war and suspicious of anything that is external, and that's because of his view of the body. He regards his body as his own enemy, almost. Because if you think about it, when you've got a toothache, what else do you think about? Nothing. You got a, like if you have a sore, I don't know what. Or you're, you know, chronic fibromyalgia, what are you thinking about? <laughs> you break a leg, what are you thinking about? The pain of that, that pain is, occupies your mind and it takes you, it, directs your mind to your body and away from your spirit and the good of the spirit. It takes you away from your equilibrium. And so the Stoics valued equanimity above all other things. I'm going to write this word down. Brilliant. I divided it up there. It's actually one word. But it's an and even-tempered. Animus is the word for spirit in Roman, Latin, your soul. And you want to be even-tempered. You want to stay balanced. Very Eastern again, right? Balance. Don't be thrown off kilter. That's what the Stoic prizes. If war outbreaks, you can't be even-tempered. It's not possible. There's too much going on. If your body's in pain, you can't be even-tempered. It's not possible. So you try and avoid war. You suspect things that are going to throw your equanimity off balance. One of the things you do, it, you, you're suspicious even of love because love throws you off balance. You become obsessed with your beloved. You, do, you think about that person. You're not thinking about your own soul. You're thinking about somebody else's body, whatever, right? It throws you off. And so amor or, or um, eros, which is the product of Venus and her little uh, worker Cupid, is one of the means of bringing down Rome's historic enemy, Carthage. It will also threaten Aeneas himself because he falls in love with Dido. His, his fate is to found Rome. He's almost sidetracked by falling in love with Dido, Queen of Carthage. So a lot is going on in the story, multiple levels. It is a Stoic writing it. He has certain views about the human good and how it's to be achieved. He doesn't think it can be achieved through war. He doesn't think it can be achieved by the Roman people because of their origins and because of their passionate nature, etc., and he thinks we should go somewhere else. So, it, and so you can read it on two levels. Yes, there's the glory of Rome. Uh, absolutely. 
Can the glory of Rome ever be a return to the golden age? Absolutely not. Can't be done. And we will see this uh, when Aeneas goes down into the underworld. We'll read about it when we come back after the reading break. When he goes down into the underworld and comes up, and then he's presented with two gates to go through. And guess what? They're the same gates that Odysseus had. One is of ivory, the other is of horn. One's of true dreams, the other is of false dreams. He's just heard the prophecy that Rome will be in a golden age. Everything's going to be perfect. And he goes out the gate of ivory, false dreams. <laughs> Virgil is just saying, well, everything I've just told you is a bunch of nonsense. It's not going to be a golden age. It's a way of saying it. So if you just read this as the praise of uh, an imperial, uh, by an imperialist, Virgil, uh, speaking of the glory of Rome and crushing your enemies, you're not really reading it very carefully. By the way, this book, this is a, this is a great book. It's a great book for all sorts of reasons. Um, it also differs from Homer's work in, in a way I haven't mentioned yet. Uh, Virgil, or Homer originally, and I said this, it was probably an oral poem, and it was sung and memorized, and people learned it by heart, and they would recite it that way, and eventually it was written down. The author is reputed to be Homer. Homer was said to be blind. I mean, he himself is a myth mythological figure almost. Whereas this is not anything like that. This is a written epic. It was written in the beginning. It's a product of a very different age. This is a way, an age of world government, a Roman empire. They still revere the Greeks. They regard the Greeks as knowledgeable in all sort of human ways. If you were a Roman with any money, you would have a Greek slave to teach your kids because the Greeks were great teachers. They understood knowledge. But if you want to learn how to live, then you want to be like a Roman. Because the Romans know how to rule. They have the rule of law. So, okay, now you've learned all that philosophy stuff, and you've learned the ways of government, and they're, they are, these are very important. You learn the Greek language. Everyone literate in, in Rome knows Greek, by the way, and they write in Greek to show that they're educated. But they speak in Roman, and they, they say that there is something superior to the Greek ways, and that's the rule of law, and we Romans know how to do that. And when we build things, they last. Like this is built to last forever. And you can go to Rome and see that the Roman roads are still there. All roads lead to Rome, and they are still literally under your feet. It's, a, it's quite extraordinary. In Toronto, the roads don't last under your feet for, for a year. You dig them all up. You know, two seasons in, in Toronto, there's winter, and then there's roadworks. Go from one to the next. It's a great place to drive a car. And then they block the rest of them up so that you can ride a bike on it. Anyway, uh, never mind. That's another topic. That way lies madness. Let's not go there. But he, he wrote it, and we have his text very clear that we, we have many copies of Virgil's Aeneid. And the reason why is because Virgil's work was accepted by the church. I, I say, it's interesting because it talks about an empire that is in many ways, in, in, from the vantage point of the Bible, the new Babylon. This is a terrible place. This is the place where Christ is persecuted. These are the people that are persecuting the Jews. They're hostile. They're saying that Caesar is Lord. They eventually, they're going to they're going to persecute the Christians. So why would you hold up an, a Roman epic as something that Christians ought to read? Well, it's in part because Virgil wrote another work. And I, I'm, going to, I'm going to pick it up a little bit later in the course when we look at Dante. It, it was called the um, Eclogues, and he speaks of a figure that sounds an awful lot like Christ. And that's, in fact, how we've seen he was a prophet. He saw, without knowing, the coming of the Messiah. The lion lying down with the lamb. 
a little child leading. All, it sounds like Isaiah, really. I'll, I'll show it to you in a couple of weeks. And because of that, and because of the, uh, the fact that Latin was the language of the church in the West, and Virgil wrote the best Latin, he was used as like a school text. If you want to learn to write good Latin, you read Virgil. So there, an idea that even though he did not know Christ, his work seemed to point to Christ. Not the Aeneid, but another work. And also his Latin was so good, and they, so they used it for that purpose. Um, and so it was like a grammar textbook. And then, of course, Rome became the center of the Holy Roman Empire. So there was Rome, the original Rome, and then it became the seat where the popes resided, etc. So there was the, a, a different meaning and significance of Rome, the city within the city, as it were, and literally eventually became the Vatican City, etc. And everyone in Christendom, at least in Western Christendom, wrote in Latin even during the Reformation. Calvin, Luther, they write in Latin, actually. You may not have known that, but they're, write, they're all writing back and forth in Latin. They're disputing. They're speaking to one another in Latin when they're in public. Ger Luther's not speaking German. He's speaking in Latin. When he's debating with people from other countries, they're all talking in the common language, which is Latin. So those reasons uh, were reasons why the, this epic became uh, even more important and more significant than I would say in Homer. In fact, in the Western world, this is interesting, they lost Homer's works when, when Islam uh, appeared, 7th, 8th century. It quickly, through conquest, overtook the whole of the Eastern Christian world centered around Constantinople. They just conquered. And with that, the Greek works of Homer were lost. They were not even read in the West. They were referred to, people, oh, the great Homer, but nobody had actually read Homer. Didn't, it didn't appear for another several hundred years. But Virgil was held, and this is the great standard of literature then, not, not Homer. Although Virgil cites Homer, appeals to him, nobody's read him. So very uh, important and interesting figure, and a very different model of a hero. His piety is the distinctive feature. It's used over and over and over by Virgil. He keeps talking about Aeneas's piety. And this is an important feature that really does track well with Christian virtue as well. Honoring the gods, loving your neighbor. Where it doesn't track, of course, is loving your enemies. That's not there in the Roman <laughs> conception. But he's a, as I say, if you track the whole of the epic, I'm just talking an overview right now. If you track the whole of the epic, the Aeneid, as I say, the, this, it starts off with Aeneas more or less like Odysseus. He's weeping. He, he really wants to be home. By home, it means Troy. He wants to be back there. He has to leave it. He's, he's heartbroken to have to leave it. But he's been given the, given the mission to found a new Troy, and so he goes and does it. Book six, I will, I will focus on, um, a class after this, is a transitional figure because he goes down to the underworld. But he goes down into the underworld as a Trojan. When he comes up, he's a Roman. So he's, it's like a new birth. Like he goes down and he is, he's sad. He's still lamenting what's lost. Then he gets a vision for the future of what lies before him, the glory of Rome, the whole of human history is told, uh, at least from the Roman point of view, there in the underworld. And then he comes up and now he's ready. Born again, as it were.
Um, but he's Roman and he's not like the Greeks. He's more interested in uh, the community. So this makes him more, again, it, from a world vantage point. The Greeks are very much individualistic, marked by individualism. The Romans are marked very much by the community. This makes them very friendly with the way most historic communities look at the world. The group matters more than the individual. And that's what Hector was like in, in the uh, Iliad even. Hector was not like Achilles. In some ways, Hector was his moral superior. This is, if you want to be a great hero, you need a great uh, opponent. You know, <laughs> I don't. It's because it's it's a terrible comparison. It is a terrible. It's Batman needs a Joker. You need a really great enemy, but the Joker's not good. He's not admirable. Hector is admirable. He is a very admirable character to defeat, and he when when he defeats him, he dishonors the body, drags him around the city three times. It's disgraceful. Even the gods are outraged at Achilles' treatment of Hector. And so great is Priam, Hector's father, that he comes to Achilles to beg for his son's body. And effectively, he's placing himself at risk here. This is still the king. The city's not fallen. He goes outside the city gates to get his son's body because it's the right thing to do. And you know what? Achilles says, here is a man. Here is a man I respect. He does the right thing. He's put his own life at risk. He's put the risk of the whole city at risk, and he lets him have his son's body. It is a moving passage. If you get the whole dynamic there, nobody can tame Achilles. Priam did. His dead son, he came and asked for the body. Walks right into the tent, right in the middle of a war. Um, so Aeneas is also, so Achilles is interested in glory, so is Aeneas. But Aeneas's glory looks forward. Achilles' glory is his glory. It, it, it's attached to him. We're gonna talk about Aeneas, or, or sorry, Achilles. You talk about Achilles. That's why he won't fight, by the way. At the begin, the first word in the Iliad is rage, or wrath, the wrath of Achilles. That's the first word in the Iliad. Because why? Because his glory has not been recognized by Agamemnon. He is so outraged. I am the greatest man on the face of the earth. You will acknowledge it. Nope, I'm going to take your girl. All right, you're going to show me disrespect. I'm not going to fight. I don't fight, you don't win. He won't, he won't fight. And he finally is provoked to fight. And then he shows, of course, that he is the best man by beating the best man of the Trojans, right? And then it's all over. Like the city has not yet fallen, but once Hector is done, the city has lost its greatest representative and really the battle is effectively over. It's a representative thing. But it, and so we see the greatness and the glory of Achilles. Nobody doubts the glory of Achilles. We talk about Achilles. But Aeneas, his glory doesn't point to him. It points to Rome. It points to his son. It points to his parents. It points to his nation. All of the things away from him. In that sense, it's piety, great virtue, little heard of in our day. He's a bit like Abraham, one author says. He's founding a city that he will never see, helping to achieve glory for people who will not live until many generations later. He is Father Aeneas, much like Abraham is Father Abraham. That, in that sense. He doesn't live by faith but he is denying himself in that sense. Comments or questions at this point? Yes, sir. I can't hear.
sort of goes with empire. Pardon me? Sort of goes with empire. Go That's, with empire. yep. So if you look at history, this is a really interesting question. It's what the Greeks fought against the Persians for. The Persians had an empire. Everyone was subsumed under the Persian Empire. You can be part, it's like the Borg in Star Trek, right? You're the, they're the collective. We will assimilate you. Everything that's good about you will become part of the Persian Empire. We will, and it says, yes, but there is no individuality there. There's no freedom. There's, it's just, it's the collective. And we don't want that. Right, so you get this, the, the fight between the Greeks and the Persians over, is over exactly that issue. The Persian and the Greeks don't want an empire. They don't want it. They're offered honor places. You ever watch 300, you know, the movie, I mean, it's pretty bloody, but it is a real battle. The Spartans defending the pass against the Persians, right? Uh, and it's all for that reason, right? We will not bow the knee. We're, we are not going to give up our freedom for the sake of the collective. We're not going to do it. And the prize placed on individual freedom is very, very strong in the Greeks. It's, the, it's part of Greek history. The Romans also prize it, so much so that, again, this is why Julius Caesar is eventually executed, executed, stabbed by his friends, because he is calling himself, or people are wanting him to be Caesar, be our emperor, and they can see that he wants it because he's, he's power hungry. They can, his friends can see it. They know he wants it, and, it's, and the people are begging him. They love Caesar because he wins all his fights. He's a great man. He's a truly great man. They're not denying his greatness. They fear his greatness. That's the problem because when we give a man who's great his due, it, everyone suffers for it. So you raise the British. Are the British responsible for empire or did they get dragged into it by the goodness and greatness of their own accomplishments? And the answer is it's a bit of both. If there's a negative side and there's even a positive side of it. Okay, we can do better than what's going on here. We can improve things. In addition, the, the, the British empire is a little bit more complicated because there are Christians in the midst of the empire. They bring the gospel along with them. It's a different motivation. And they genuinely do. Like the gospel transformed modern India. One of my friends Vishal Mangalwadi argues this, that what made modern India is actually the Christians, William Carey and company. But that's off topic. Um, but they will uh, get beyond the petty tribal quarrels. They will build roads and institutions. They'll bring about prosperity with that. They will bring about schools and hospitals. Romans didn't do that. They conquered. It's, and the Persians likewise. They're not interested in human improvement, but the British did. They, they did improve the countries they came to, I think because of a Christian understanding. And they give them the rule of law, which allowed for liberties within those countries and a, and a, a reverence for liberties. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm very much against the idea that the, liber that the Roman Empire is to be compared to the British Empire, not that there are no atrocities, because there are some. Not nearly as many as you might think, not comparatively so. But there are some, for sure. It's just a, there, you need a little bit of a balanced portrait. But still, this is the danger. With empire, you can do things that you could not do without it. But one of the consequences is very, very bad for human freedom. And eventually, what began as an apparently good idea ends up very quickly morphing into, this was a very bad idea and we never should have done it. And so when, it, when countries that are republics go towards being empires, there's a resistance internally by the virtuous that say, we don't want to go down that path because it, it leads to our own national ruin as well as the ruin of the countries that we go to. That's, what, that's the problem the United States is facing right now. And it's not because the Americans are bad. Yeah, that's just, that's a very superficial take. Yes? No, no, okay. That was the hand. Yes? 
stoicism. Okay. Um, you mentioned kind of the idea that uh, they, they were obsessed with this idea of um, rejecting the body. And, and the good of the soul. Yeah, the good of the soul. And the soul, their body, they didn't see as themselves. They saw the soul as themselves. It rejects the idea of a soul uh, separated from the body. To be a human being is to have a bodily nature, and the the body is a good thing. They don't regard it as so. Because in like my readings of like Paul in Romans and whatnot, he talks about that idea of flesh and spirit, and flesh does things like the spirit. Like the yes. He does, but flesh does not mean body. Flesh is a reference to the sinful nature. It's a very technical term for Paul. It sounds like he's talking about this, like mind-body dualism or soul-body dualism, you know, privilege the soul and deny the body. He's not talking about that, though. He's talking about uh, the flesh, and he doesn't mean the body by that. He's talking about your sinful desires, and your body is not the source of your sinful desires, your sin nature is, and that's your body is not your sin nature. It's in your soul. Your soul is corrupted, as well as your body. Your body is going to die, but your soul is connected to that. It's, it's a complicated subject, but that when he talks about the flesh, he's not talking about it as if it were the same thing as the body. You can we can talk about this afterwards. It's a very important topic in Christian theology. The way you really come ad, to address it, though, is just to say what I said. At the outset, God himself took on human flesh. And a very strong emphasis in the scriptures on the fact that, that though this was God, he was also man. He was actually crucified bodily. He was raised bodily. He was seen by the disciples after his resurrection. He ate with them. They could stick their fingers in his side, or at least he offered that. There's no sense that this was a non, like a spirit, but not a body, which the spirit would be the way it'd be portrayed by the Greeks and the Romans. Like after death, you're a shade. You go down to the underworld. This is not a shade in front of them. So that says something very important about human nature as well, because remember, we bear the image of God. It's so very, like this is not unimportant now, but we're getting into anthropology here, but very important. It has consequences. I, I totally agree. But Paul is not talking about against the body, he's talking against the flesh, and the flesh is a reference to a sinful nature that inclines towards disobedience to God, etc. But the Stoics don't see it that way. They see the soul as the essence of you, and it's just trapped in a body. And eventually you get released from that. And that's not a bad thing. Which is why you can take your own life, by the way. They don't regard suicide as forbidden. On the contrary, it's sometimes an honorable thing to do. In fact, if you think you're about to be violated by intruders, whatever, rather take your own life so that doesn't happen. Like, before somebody does violence to you, you know, take it into your own hands as painlessly, quickly as you can. Don't go through the indignity to your own soul of that desecration that's about to happen. So they commit suicide, Stoics, all the time. Christians don't. Why? Because the body and the soul are connected. It's you, right? That's a different viewpoint, different view of the body, and also of, also of who is the Lord of the body. It's not you. It's God, right? Very different connections and also uh, consequences to that. Um, let me say one more thing about this uh, piety of Aeneas. It's in the uh, book two when Rome is, or Rome, Troy is burning. Aeneas escapes with his father on his back. Like that image of coming out of a flaming city with your father on your back. I mean, your father's not light. And he's carrying him, and he's leading his little boy Ascanius or Eulus. By the way, Eulus is an ancestor of Julius, as in Julius Caesar, who is the adopted father of Augustus. 
That's the connection there. This little boy who he's holding by the hand, he's got father on his back, he's got his son's hand in his, and he loses his wife. He's heartbroken, but he loses her in the flames. But he's got his hands full. Dad's on the back, son's hands here. What's in the other hand? The ancestral gods. The, family, the household gods are in his hand. He's carrying them because they're that important to him. He loses his wife in the process, in the flames. These are the gods of the old city. These are the, uh, that he's carrying with him. These are his ancestors. But there's something about the old city that he's going to carry with him. It matters. It's part of his identity. Even when he goes here, he will be connected to the old city. It's, there's a religious as well as a public dimension to this. By the way, if you think about it, and you know enough about this from your exposure to the Bible, uh, cities are devoted often to a particular goddess. Like, uh, Ephesus, it was Artemis. Athens, it was Athena. They, they worshipped all the gods, but they often were dedicated to one particular god. Troy was also dedicated to a god. The god was Venus. She was not happy that her city was burnt by the Greeks, but that was fate. But it was also fate that her people would establish a new city, and it would be the greatest city. Now, if you think about it in terms of that fall from gold to silver to bronze to iron age, is that going to be a better city then? Well, no. Now, this city is not founded uh, on wisdom, but rather on lust and passion and eros. That's not going to be a very good city. If Venus is the uh, goddess that lies behind it. But this piety is connected with his fate. That's the final point I want to make here. It's connected to his fate. I had that on the whiteboard. Maybe I can, I never even got to this. I took so much time to put this down and I didn't even look at it. I'll give it up now. Oh well. He's fated to be great. Like it is, it is said by the gods that this will happen. At the beginning of this epic, um, I talked about epic, epic conventions but never got to them. It, it, they are basically as before. It begins in the middle of things. In medias res, it begins in the middle of things. There is a council of the gods. They talk about what's going on on earth. And they are going to start the motion of, we have an epic hero, Aeneas. And the gods are there to fulfill what has been fated. Remember, the gods do not orchestrate everything. They, the, things that are fated and can't be changed, that's what they're to execute. And it's fated that this happened. And the way it happens is through his piety. So there's a connection between fatum, fate, and pietas, piety. Fate is how you relate to the ultimate god, which is a blind, unchangeable, destiny. He's fated to be the founder of a people. Rome is fated to be great. These things cannot be changed. Carthage, which is in the, on the coast of Africa, north coast where Libya is, was fated to be Rome's historic enemy. And they, would have, they fought wars of supremacy within the Mediterranean over the centuries, the Punic Wars. They had great generals, the Carthaginians, Hannibal, and so forth. They're, when you do the Roman epics, they're often mentioned, the Carthaginians and the Romans. They were also fated, but who were they fa They were fated to do what? They were fated, to, one, to become a great empire, but then fated to be crushed by the Romans, only after a time. And their goddess, Juno, to be humiliated by Aphrodite. She's not happy about this either. I'll talk more about that next time, but um, it's a complex picture, but it's driven by fate, by the gods. Eventually, he's going to, it's written, oh, 
so other epic conventions. It's written in epic language, the diction. I talked about the beauty of the Latin language here. It uses epic similes and so forth. Um, he will go down into the underworld. And I mentioned the final new feature is that it, epics from this point onward will always seek to outdo their forebears in their greatness. My subject matter is far greater than yours. You're talking about a man and his greatness. I'm talking about a people and their greatness. This is far superior to yours. We're going to find, come the Christian era, that Christians are going to have a different take on it. Okay, well, you had a nation. We have an entire, the entirety of human history and so forth. You can keep one-upping. There's, there's a limit to that. But anyway, that's enough for now. <laughs>